about just saying that so I'll be invited back. Uh, so uh, nice group, big group, and I, I'm really fortunate. I, I go around all over the world doing workshops and teaching people uh, how to paint the way they've always wanted to paint. And uh, I noticed that there was, this was called the Watercolor Society. It's really an aqua media society after what I've just seen here today as an aqua media society. And we always like to say if it dissolves in water, we're going to paint with it. So that's acrylics and temperas and watercolors and things like that. Thank you, class. My class is here tonight also. So you can, uh, uh, by the way, everything up on the wall is for sale. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not, nothing over $10,000. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it was my honor to be with a group of very, very aggressive, very talented uh, painters. Uh, it makes my job a whole lot easier when I have people who aren't whiners. They just jump right into it, even though I was throwing uh, acrylic at them and all kinds of other water-soluble things. <laughs> and they just went for it. And I think you can certainly tell by looking around here all the fabulous work uh, that they're doing. And uh, it's, uh, we're doing a little bit of everything. We always like to say it's like five years of art school jammed into five days. So I have them working really hard. We're doing some basic things, you know, the color wheel and lights and darks and things like that. But uh, we've been edging them towards the abstract thing. That's really what this is all about. And that's what tonight's presentation is going to be. I'm going to be doing some abstract work. Wish me luck. Uh, but I'll talk about certain things what makes an abstract and uh, certainly talk about the 12 compositions in an abstract. And I'll just go right ahead and do one uh, eventually. If you're having a hard time seeing uh, this, too bad. <laughs> just kidding. Really, if you really want to, if you, I, I welcome you to come around and get close to me. Uh, if, if you're having a hard time seeing or something like that, I welcome you to come on by. Um, well, yeah, I'm, I am one of the lucky ones in the world. I, I am one of the most fortunate persons out there. Uh, I get to, uh, for the past 18 years, a lot of you, my students, know this story, but for the past 18 years, I've been fortunate to be able to paint every day. Think about that. And I'm still excited about running down to my studio. I am, I live on the Central Coast. I uh, went through the corporate office real fast. I went up uh, the corporate ladder real fast. And, and uh, every night I'd come home and paint. You know, I'd do the weather coat and tie and suit and all that stuff during the day. And that night I'd come home and paint. Finally, it hit me. It just bang. And this was about 18 years ago. And I said to my wife, honey, I, I don't want to paint anymore. I mean, I don't want to paint anymore. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to do this corporate thing anymore. And she said, "What do you want to do?" And I said, "What I really want to do is probably the most irresponsible thing I can think of. I just want to quit this thing, this whole big corporate thing, and be a painter." And she said, "Sweetheart, go do it. But you go do it, and you paint every day. Don't worry about the bills, the kids in colleges, and all that stuff." And, Oh, great. Dad's going to be a painter. I guess I have to drop out of college, they said. I should tell you, they all graduated. Do you know how many paintings you have to sell to get your kids? <laughs> so that was 18 years ago. We moved out. We were living in Santa Barbara, California, and I moved about an hour north to a little country farm, a house and bought some property up there, and, and saw a little hay barn and kicked the cows out and moved in. That was my studio, and I've been there ever since. And uh, seriously, Saturdays, Sundays, Wednesdays, Tuesdays, I have no idea what day it is. I don't even know where I am right now. I've been able to paint every day. I'm one of the lucky ones. So, um, uh, and, then, and then eventually we start doing those weekend festivals, you know, in the tents and trying to see if anybody likes my work. And we start, we go home in an empty truck with a lot of money. I was, oh my gosh, I guess I have something here. So that certainly encouraged me to paint more and continue doing this. Eventually we got picked up by a large gallery in San Francisco called Gallery Carla. And we've been together for about the past 10 years. I'm fortunate to be in galleries from Australia, Hawaii, San Francisco, and I don't know where all the other ones are. Uh, I just paint man. <laughs> <laughs> and my wonderful wife manages the whole thing. I really, I, and so I, I, we all need a wife like Kate. Right now, Kate needs a wife. Uh, she works hard. We, we're a great team. And uh, that's what it is. It's, it's not a job. It's a lifestyle. And to be able to have the luxury of running down to my studio every day and not knowing what I'm going to be doing, uh, she gives me my honey-do list, you know. <laughs> the gallery needs this, the gallery needs that, and we have some commissions to do. And I take it, I go down, and I, I just paint. I crank, crank on the music, and I just go for it. And it's pretty exciting, and you'd think I'd be burned out by now. I have more energy as my class, unfortunately, <laughs> has found out, than, uh, than feeds me. And I can't believe this is how I'm making a great living. And every once in a while, that the zookeepers let me out of the studio, and I get to be with artists like yourself. So I'm, I feel as though I'm home, and certainly the hospitality, and certainly the organization of this uh, 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 North Star 
Aqua Media Society. <laughs> uh, and I really think you should, it has been great. I really think you should start thinking about that, because the name change. Uh, uh, because I do go around all over the United States and France and, and Mexico, and that's what they're doing. You know, the quote unquote, even the San Diego Watercolor Society has switched over to acrylics. And boy, that's a pretty large organization. But I go down there an awful lot. And I'll be going, leaving here and going down to Austin, Texas, to their watercolor society. I jury the show. And, uh, and I'll be teaching for a week down there. And uh, they're going to be bringing in acrylics, tempers. You know, as I said, if it dissolves in water, what the heck. And quite frankly, folks, if I gave you a bucket of mud and a piece of paper, I bet you would create something with it. Yeah. You? Yeah, because you're artists. You know, you've been given this God, goddess gift to be an artist your whole life. You've been an artist your whole life. You know, and uh, uh, you need to uh, use everything that's in front of you. And we do, don't we? If I gave you a set of crayons, you'd make something with it. So uh, it's time to expand out and, and you know, and throw uh, paint all over the place and, and, and paint the way you've always wanted to paint. Stop painting for somebody else's approval who's not a painter. Hint, hint, hint. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's true. You have been given this great gift. What are you going to do with it? You're going to sit around and keep doing the same old, same old, same old stuff you see in every watercolor magazine? Don't start looking around now. <laughs> They're all start pointing at each other. Not but it's the truth. I mean, after a while, well, we see all these watercolor magazines, and I write articles for it too, and things like that, but. You know, after a while, we don't know who's who anymore because we're all copying each other. And it becomes anonymous. You know, you've been given this great gift. What are you going to do with it? Yes, we're really good at copying. That's how you learn. That's true. That's how you learn. I mean, I remember when I was in college, they would send me down to the Philadelphia Museum and set up my easel in front of a John Singer sergeant or a Picasso or something like that. And that's really how you learn when you can do it in those days. Uh, I had a chance, by the way, to run over, really run through the Walker Museum last night. You are so fortunate to have such a spectacular, I know you already know this, uh, museum. I, I'm just so blown away by the contemporary work right there. I'm, and I was realizing, I said, oh my gosh, this is the year 2005, and we're looking at 2005 artwork. And then I'll come out and I'll look at some of the amateur shows and the stuff that looks like it was done in 1920. Why is that? I don't understand that. And the framing looks like it was done in 1920. We're, we're new, folks. It's time to think new and, and stop you know, falling into what I call the safe zone or the boring zone and doing old, ugly, dark frames and dark mats and things like that. This is a contemporary <coughs> society. It's a very contemporary times. It will set your heart and your soul and your creative spirit free when you start painting the way you've always wanted to paint not listening to all these naysayers about watercolor. I'm just a watercolor painter, and I'm only into transparent. How boring. Get a life. <laughs> I mean, yes, we could do that, and I've done it, too. I've done it, and I was, I remember when I first started 18 years ago, I'm a watercolorist at the time. I would sit there on my desk and sit down and get my cute little brush, just like you guys do. You sit there and you go, <laughs> and, you know, and pray to God you don't get any uh, blossoms or blooms in your watercolor. <laughs> and I said, wait a minute, I, if I'm going to be doing this the rest of my life, I'm not going to be sitting down and, and doing the same old, same old and copying everybody else. And Oh, look, I know how to do doilies and, and geraniums and wicker baskets. <laughs> <laughs> what are we doing here? What we're doing, we're copying each other. I'm going to give you an opportunity here to... Uh, break out and paint the way you have always wanted to paint. So I give you permission to paint the way you have always wanted to paint. And watch how much happens. Well, just look at the work around here. I mean, I haven't taught them anything. They already came with that zest and, and zeal to be the best of the, who, who they wanted to be and to paint for themselves. What a concept, as opposed to trying to get paint for somebody else's approval who's not a painter or whatever. And you can tell by the work that you see on the wall here, these are very fantastic, emerging, creative spirit types of uh, <coughs> contemporary painters. And I'm just, it made my job so much easier. I was very impressed by the quality of work. Obviously, they have some good teachers. And my teachers, <coughs> and the, your teachers are in this class too, which made it a lot easier for me too. So uh, I thank you and I welcome you. And, and I'm, I feel so welcome to be here. So 
Uh, what we're going to do tonight is basically I'm going to just throw some paint around. I pity the people in the first two rows. <laughs> it's going to be like a Gallagher concert. <laughs> we usually bring big plastic sheets and cover up everybody and then just throw paint all over the place. Not a pretty sight, but I'm having a great time. And you know, and it should be a good time. You should be smiling when you're painting, not sitting there going, <laughs> which I know you do. And I know you hold your breath the whole time you do a whole painting. <laughs> I don't know how you do that. And I know you take a deep breath, here I go, and you, and you hold your breath during the entire time. And your shoulders get, you know, you know uh, welded to your earlobes here, and you hold your breath for the entire time you do the painting. This, it should be an it should be a uplifting, creative, fun time to paint. And so you're all using way too many small brushes. You know, your brushes should, your minimum size brush should be the size <laughs> I didn't bring them off. So <laughs> and it's true. You know, that's the thing is, I know why you go to the small brush. You think you're going to be in more control. You're actually in less control. You say, if I get the, you know, if I get the smaller brush, I can be really in control and do all this little detail. What are you doing? You're showing off your technical skill. Look, I really know how to make something look like something. Aren't I good? We've got to stop doing this stuff, folks. <laughs> we know how to make things look like things. You know, if I had you all working on the same project and I set up a still life, I could have you all copy it and you all walk out the front door and they'd all be the same. Because we really are, I mean, we have been given this great talent. We know how to copy. <coughs> but that's how you learn. But what would happen if you try to paint a still life without having anything in front of you? What about doing a landscape without going outside? And at my age, I can't do that because I've got to be close to the bathrooms. <laughs> <laughs> the flower paintings. You should see all the other, you know, it's all what they're doing, the fruits and vegetables. We don't have anything in front of us. We keep painting it until it looks good. What a concept. So you don't get this, you don't get this anchor of always looking at the subject matter. And you get the freeness of painting it the way you've always wanted to paint. Now we're not saying this is right or wrong. I'm just going to explain to you, this is what works for me. You know, uh, if you want to be happy, to keep doing the same old, same old, God bless you. Great. I can say that in a church. God bless you. But, uh, but are you really that happy? No. You know, you might get this, you might get a couple of ribbons, and everyone's happy, and you go home, and that's fine. I have to make a living at it. No, I want to make a living at it. And if my work looks like everybody else, it's going to still end up coming back to me at the end of the show, and it goes under the bedroom and in the closet, just like all those paintings you have under your bed. Wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice if every once in a while you sold a painting so you can go out and buy some more uh, Holbein paints or something like that. Wouldn't it be nice? Now, I'm not saying that you have to sell all the time, but every once in a while it would be nice to go out and buy new good products. And the way to do that, and if you're the way to win awards, is not showing off your technical skill, but what you paint what's in your heart. I know you hear this all the time. I know I'm preaching to the choir. But it's the truth. But in, in, when we do a painting in here, the things that our, we have all learned this week, there's three things. Three things. Well, I call it the three C's. One is, the first C is content. <coughs> My class is so bored hearing this. <laughs> content or your intentions. What are your intentions? If you have no intentions at the beginning of a painting, you're not going to find it halfway or at the end. <laughs> if you have no intentions of what you're about to paint, it's not worth doing, it's not even worth looking at. And that's the, actually, that is the hardest part about painting. What are my intentions? Painting's the easy part. It really is, isn't it? But coming up to why am I doing this in the first place is the hardest thing. So I'm going to encourage you to write a lot in your journal. Write, 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 write. Don't edit yourself while you're writing. Do what I call stream of consciousness writing. Just keep writing, writing, writing. Okay, that's the first C, content. The second C is color. I'm not going to bore you with the color wheel tonight. You pretty much know what the color wheel is all about. But I mean, go ahead and follow. The color, somebody's already figured it out for you. Tools. Get a big color wheel and put it in your studio. And refer to it every once in a while. You know, when I'm painting, I can't remember what the complement of blue is. What is it? I have to go look at it. Even after 18 years, you'd think I'd know these things. It's not important to me. I have it on the wall. So get a color wheel and use it. Get a simple one and learn what the complementary colors are. Use it. These are the decisions, by the way, you make before you begin to paint. I know what happens to you. Oh boy, today I get to paint. No interruptions. And you go down into your studio and you squeeze out all the tubes of paint. Are you talking? You're out of control already, and halfway through your painting, you're lost, aren't you? 
because you didn't write down your goals, or your contents, or your intentions. And you got all these colors out here, and every time you, le you, you leave the, the uh, integrity of the color wheel, you're going to get lost. That's why you end up painting mud. We're real good at that, aren't we? You know? So, uh, so please, you choose the color, uh, the combination you want, like whether it's complementary or triadic or split complementary. I'm not going to teach you about that stuff. You know about that stuff. So these are decisions you make before you even pick up your tube of paint. So if you're going to use three colors, such as the triadics, it, it'll be, let's say, yeah, yellow. You pull out the yellow. Great. Put that out. And you, and you go four over. That's blue. You pull that out. You go four over. And that's your red. And you pull that out. Oh, my gosh. That happened to be having the, 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 the primary. So you only use those three colors plus black and white. And you keep everything, you know, I know what happens to you. You're an artist. It's like getting your first box of crayons. You open them up and you want to use all 64 colors, right? <laughs> By the way, get your own box of crayons. For your, don't give them to your grandkids. Get your own box of crayons and have them out there by the TV's table or wherever. Have them everywhere, with a pad of paper. Keep them out. Let people know that you're an artist. Crayons are great. No, by the way, you get the kind with a pencil sharpener on the side. It's really cool. And I should warn you, the gold color and the silver color still does not work to this day. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. And the second C, the third C is composition. We all forget about composition. That's why your paintings fall apart. And you all know about composition, but you don't do it. So I'm going to show you real fast, real fast, about composition, and then I'm going to go right into painting. Okay, so what I have here are actually abstracts, versions. You don't have to write this stuff down. Uh, I'm sure they're going to sell videotape. <laughs> <laughs> so how is this, Mr. Videotape Man? Is this good for you? Frank is the name. Frank is the name. And it's good. Thank you for asking. Okay, there you go. <laughs> well, we all know who the videographer is. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thanks, Frank. Yeah. So, um, I'll show it this way so he can see it and some of you can see it in the mirror. And if you can't see it in the back, I'll hold it up. Okay, the first composition is pretty basic. Now, again, these are the 12 things that your painting is going to fall into one of these categories. Now, I know we artists don't like to be put in a box. Get over it. Okay, your painting is going to fall into one of these 12 categories. And again, these are the decisions you make before you even begin a painting. Okay, so bear with me and then we'll get into painting. Okay, the first composition is pretty obvious. It's called the cruciform. I know a lot of you have books on this stuff, and uh, you know the books you don't read. I know you have lots of books. <laughs> you don't read the books. I know you have a hundred brushes. How many brushes do you really paint with? Maybe two or three. I, you know why you do that? Because we're artists and we we are we collectors. We need to be have everything around us because when we reach for it, it better be there. You know, and we think if we go out and buy all these, these quickie and little surefire ways of doing a painting, it'll guarantee you the end result. How many times have you been disappointed? Folks, it just comes down to a tube of paint, one brush, and good paper or a canvas. And stop worrying about all these gimmicks that they love to sell you because they know you artists will buy them. Okay? So be careful. You can't, if you can't do it with good paint, and I mean good paint, stop buying cheap paint, by the way. I know you buy the cheap paint because this is your thinking. We walk into the art store, I'm going to get the cheap paint because I'll wait till I'm better. Right? So what are you doing? You'll never be a better painter by surrounding yourself with inferior materials. You owe it to yourself and your talent and your skills and your gifts to surround yourself with the best stuff you possibly can. Again, I know I apologize for preaching to the choir, but you've got to start thinking that way. And good brushes, too. And also the, the real good 39 cent throwaway kind. You know where the hair falls out? Good cheap brushes are great. More texture. Yeah. <laughs> okay, enough of that. So the first composition your painting will fall uh, into will be the cruciform. And under the cruciform, it's a pretty standard composition. We all know it. You can do anything. Within these boundaries, I've picked my I've chosen my colors. I know my intentions. I'm gonna do, say, angels or guardian angels or something like that on this one. And the the design composition is going to be the cruciform. Boom. Now I can go play. This is where the creative part comes in. I've set up the guidelines. I've set up the rules, what I'm going to work on. I don't have all my colors out. Now I get to play. This is the best part. See, I don't have to think anymore because I know that whatever I do, it will work. We, over, we, over, we tend to overthink this whole process, so it's pretty simple. Okay, here's the cruciform. Cruciform. 
I mean, it can be anything, but just know that your pain is going to fall into one of these categories. So we have the cruciform. The next one you see here is asymmetrical. Asymmetrical means unbalanced, or everything's on one side, and something's way over here. Kind of like putting the heavy kid in the middle of the seesaw, and you put the little the light kid on the way out the end. That's imbalanced kind of a thing, which makes it a perfect balanced seesaw. So this is, uh, would be known as asymmetrical. It's kind of great fun. Whether you're a landscape painter or a still life painter, these are the compositions you're going to use. Okay. The next one is overlapping squares. Overlapping squares or frames. Pretty simple. So be a test tomorrow morning, by the way. <laughs> be a test. So we have overlapping frames or overlapping squares. Great way of going. And overlapping circles or or uh, ovals or something like that, very organic. So we have overlapping circles too. All right, that's another composition. Again, these are the decisions you make before you start the painting. Okay. Then we have, <laughs> pretty obvious here, everything's horizontal. Everything's horizontal. Okay. Or everything is vertical. <laughs> Duh. <All right. laughs> so it's, it's, everything's vertical. Okay. And with that, you again, you can do anything. You can do people, trees birch trees or whatever. By the way, it sure was wonderful to walk on uh, colorful leaves. I haven't done that in a long time. I love listening to smelling the air. It has no, thank you very much for the my California weather, by the way. It's been really nice here. But walking on those leaves, it took me back to my childhood. I kept wanting to burn them. <laughs> this is called, believe it or not, the constellation. There is an actual composition called the constellation. You're just, your eyes are everywhere. It's like looking up at the stars on your beautiful evenings here and seeing billions and billions of stars, and your eye tends to start to group them together, and that's when you start seeing <coughs> constellations and, and shapes and objects and scorpions floating in the space and things like that. So that actually is a legitimate composition. It's going to get a little more complicated now. But this one's diagonal. Everything's diagonal. Okay, you may, again, you make this decision, whether it's a still life or landscape, it could be a bunch of rocks, you know, cliffs and things like that, but the whole composition falls under the diagonal composition, okay? This one is called meandering. There actually is a composition. Think of Jackson Pollock. Meandering means it has no beginning and it has no end. You don't know where, to, where your eyes are going to settle into. You know, it has, no, it has no focal point in a sense, in a sense. And you don't know where to start, you don't know where to stop. And so we call that meandering. It's great fun. Try it. I want you to try all these things. It will change your lives, okay? The next one, kind of a strange one, it's called tension. Tension. Like sometimes you ever look at a painting and go, ooh, I'm not so, I'm not so sure. You know, something just bothers me. Good, then that means the artist is very successful. He created tension. So in this case, something like this, like this big wedge thing looks like it's going to slide down and, and demolish this little round. You don't want to be this little round thing, <laughs> you see. And so it's, you look at it and say, oh, I'm not so sure. It's pleasing enough uh, design, but notice how you just don't want to be that little sucker down there. Okay. okay. So that's called tension. It's great. Give yourself these painting assignments one each day and spend about five or ten minutes on this. Just use black and white. And, and have, that way you'll have them under your belt. <coughs> you put them up on the wall. And these will be one of your best cheat sheets, so to speak. Best ponies ever. You know, and you get them up on the wall. It will help you and remind you. This one is based on your culture, your history, your religion, uh, your nationality. And this is called sacred places. There are some paintings that just take you to a sacred place. And it could be a mandala, you know, a very spiritual thing. It all depends, again, on your culture, your history, your beliefs, and things like that. You're all going to come up with different sacred places, such as if I were a Mayan Indian or if I was an Egyptian, this might be a sacred place. Okay? What makes that a sacred place? It makes it sacred because uh, if I were an Egyptian, the shape of uh, the pyramids are very sacred places for the tombs. If I were a Mayan Indian, where a lot of the Mayan sculptures and uh, 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 burial sites are made into also pyramids, so it a, becomes a sacred place. It's something I'm studying right now. So to me, a sacred place is what the Mayans believed in. A mandala could be a sacred place. Again, it all depends on your own history and culture and religion and things like that. Everyone's going to have a different sacred place. Thanks for asking that question. This one is called the golden section, or one-third, one-third, one-third. 
And I'm not about to explain it to you. <laughs> Look it up. You all have books in your library, the ones you don't read, that explain to you the golden section. Basically, the golden section, I'm going to do it in 10 seconds. Whoever invented the golden section, first of all, it's all mathematics. You need T squares and rulers and, and calculators and, and fractions. See, I lost you already. <laughs> yeah, because you're artists. And every year, your magazine, Watercolor Magazine, comes out. Oh, excuse me, I think it's now going to be called the Aqua Medial Magazine. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's going to come out, and they said, we're going to explain the golden section. And you all say, yes, I'm going to sit down here with a glass of wine, and I'm going to read this article, and that's because I'm an artist. I need to know what the golden section is all about. I hear about it. I really don't understand it. And by the time you get to paragraph two, you are so bored, you never finish the article. So I'm going to show it to you in 10 seconds. It is, it is a tic-tac-toe. It's a tic-tac-toe. That's all it is. Those who have invented this are rolling over in their graves right now. Because you just divide up, again, one third, one third, one third, this way, this way, this way also. And where those lines crisscross, someone has decided that's an interesting spot to put something in the picture plane. And, but one has to be dominant. It can be here, here, here. I've just circled this. It's going to be dominant. So that's it. That's why this painting holds together. A very and your job is to camouflage it. I kind of snuck in those lines so you can kind of see it. Your job is to camouflage it, not make it so obvious, it's so static. So you have this big thing happening here. So you have one, two, three, four. Kind of see it? So again, your responsibility is to make sure that uh, it's not so obvious. It's kind of an old form of composition, but it works every time. That's it, folks. That's all you need to know about composition. There is a test tomorrow morning. Uh, the test books are in the back as you leave. I expect you to mail them in to me tomorrow morning. Now let's have some fun. Okay. Yay. Uh, I have here a full sheet of watercolor. I like uh, Fabriano, Fabriano paper. Uh, it used to be called Fabriano Uno. Uh, it's now called Fabriano uh, Artistico. Artistico. I don't know why they changed the name, but it's what it is. Now, what I always do is one more thing. A couple things. How many times have you done this? Let me see if I can get my little watercolor brush here. Here we go. How many times have you done this? You had this very expensive piece of watercolor paper, especially a full sheet. Oh my gosh, you spent ten dollars for it for something. Ooh, and you're scared already. <laughs> Is that the way to approach a painting? <laughs> Tiptoeing up to it and you know afraid of it? It's like it's gonna bite you? No. And then you get this little brush here, and here we go. First of all, you hold it up here around the furrow because you want to squeeze the bejeebies out of it because you're in control. And then you start off, with, and I know what you do. You start off with the hardest part. First, you get the, because you want to get it out of the way. Okay, I'm going to start with the bird's eyeball. <laughs> what the heck are you doing? You want to get the hard part out of the way. That is not the way to paint. Just the opposite. You want to let the paper know who's boss. You want to put your DNA all over this. I mean, rub it all over your body. Now you're not afraid of it, are you? The other thing you want to do, believe it or not, watercolorist, you want to put gesso on it. <gasps> gesso? Gesso is an acrylic primer you put on.